to hear from an amazing woman that has been such an influence in my life and has just blessed my socks off, to be honest, and has just been just amazing. I just, I can't tell you how much this woman has blessed my family's life and the school's life especially, and it's, it's just been a blessing to get to know her over this last year, and, and her husband is an amazing man as well, and they really have become just close friends of ours, and, and we just love them, and you know, she uh, she's going to be the second year overseer in school of ministry, and so if you're getting ready to get in school, this is going to be a blessing this morning. Would you guys do me a huge favor and honor Susan Anderson really well this morning? Come on. Can you hear? Is it okay? Okay. Good morning. morning. Casey called me yesterday because Casey and I are kind of alike in a lot of ways. And uh, he told me to make sure I had fun today. And when you're a 53 year old woman who tends to be introverted, the thought of getting up in front of a crowd of people and talking. The last word that comes to your mind is fun, <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> People like to say about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, but in my life, he has never been that. He's been like the father who grabs you by the scruff of the neck and the seat of the pants and chucks you into the deep end of the pool and says, swim, I know you can do it. And so for me, that's kind of what this morning is about. It's swimming and trusting the Holy Spirit because how many of you know if you're going to go forward in the things of God, you're going to have to face some giants. And if you don't conquer them, they're always going to be there because the only way you get rid of giants is you displace them. You face them and you displace them. Um, today, oh, I got to say my husband's name. Kirk there he said to mention him in the sermon so there you go <laughs> before I forget Kirk's here they always say when you preach a sermon to make sure you inject some funny but I'm not really a Corey Schneckloff you know he's one of a kind but my husband it's like the Lord searched high and low for the funniest guy on the planet that he could find to balance me out and he married me to him and so if after I'm done today, after the service, you still feel like you need an injection of funny, Kirk will be at the back of the sanctuary and he will oblige you. <laughs> I want to talk today about the unprecedented times that we're living in. Uh, I talked with Bob, he's the armor bearer today, and Pablo, and they both mentioned the word change. And if there's any word that identifies the times we're living in, it's that word, change. It's like everything is in motion. Everything is transitioning. I kind of compare it to like seismic activity, the earthquake, where everything underneath of us is in motion. It's fluid. Nothing feels stable. It's like from one day to the next, you wake up and things have changed. And uh, a lot of the prophets talk about this time as an epic season meaning that it's unprecedented in history. It's very distinguished. It's very different. It's set apart. And I want you to know today that God appointed this time and this season and this place for you to live in. You're not here by accident. You're not a child born out of season. You, you shouldn't have been born 100 years ago or 100 years in the future. You were born for such a time as this. We're in a Kairos moment. It is pregnant with opportunity. Others are saying that it's like uh, there's an acceleration in the air, that what used to take years is now taking moments. So we're seeing things happen overnight. We're seeing people change in an instant. We're seeing cities changed in an instant. It's because of the moment that we're living in. And whether you notice it or not, whether you want it or not, whether you've asked for it or not, or prayed for it or not, whether you voted for it, whether you expected it, change is going to come. And we are living in the middle of it. And there is nothing we can do to stop it. 
nothing we can do to stop it. The only thing we have control of in this moment is how we choose to respond to it. There is a, probably one of the most memorable openings to a book. It's a secular book. It's written by Charles Dickens, and it's called The Tale of Two Cities. It was written in 1775, and Charles Dickens was writing about pre-revolutionary Paris and London. And he said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. I'm telling you, when I think of that quote, I'm like, he might as well have been writing writing that about the times that we're living in right here and right now. There is a revolution. We are pre-revolution. It may not be the kind of revolution that some of our militia people are talking about, but it's a revolution of a spiritual kind that is literally going to turn the world on its ear. And you can look at it as the best of times and think about all the prophetic words that have been spoken about the days we're living in. Pablo mentioned some last week. Mariah Woodworth Eder, Smith Wigglesworth, both prophesied that a hundred years after Azusa, there would be another revival that would eclipse Azusa. 600 million people came into the kingdom and advanced in the things of the spirit. 600 million. So what is this movement going to look like? The prophet Bob Jones said, one billion souls will come into the kingdom just like that. I, I went to Colombia, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but in Colombia, Benny Hinn prophesied, and everybody's heard this prophecy as well. He said that um, in the end days, in the last great outpouring, that it would be initiated by the two uh, deaths of the two great men of God, one being, of course, Oral Roberts, who has already passed away, and the other being Billy Graham, who is 97 and will turn 98 this year. We're living in the best of times. Something happened on April 9th with Azusa Now in Los Angeles. I don't know if you feel it in your spirit, but I'm telling you, something broke. There was a breaker anointing released in that place, and we are feeling it across the nation. I just watched a video last night. I think it's in West Virginia. There has been a revival that started two weeks ago in the schools. It has spread to six different schools. 1,400 people have come into the kingdom in two weeks. I'm telling you, it is happening. And we are not going to miss out on it. We are going for it just like they are. It's the best of times. But then you, I mean, if you read Facebook and read any news feeds and threads, it's the worst of times. There are people that are, well, the scriptures uh, state that in Luke 21, 26, people will faint with terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. There's even a series on TV about what if this happens, as if reality isn't enough. Let's, you know, st uh, simulate some reality of what happens if this happens, if the atomic bomb drops or if this happens. I'm like, come on. All uh, these folks are seeing are the giants. They look at this time as opposition, as oppression. Um, and I kind of equate it to this. What is your perspective? Where are you sit seating right now? Where are you at? Are you... Do you have a heavenly perspective where you are at the right hand of the Father, seated in Christ Jesus, that you are as Jesus is, you are in the earth? Is that your perspective, a heaven to earth perspective? Or do you have a couch perspective where you're sitting on your couch and you're watching the TV hour after hour after hour after hour where the news media and entertainment is telling you what the times are like? It is a choice of perspective it's two different camps and the question we have to ask ourselves today is which camp am i going to be in matthew 24 12 he says that with the rise and increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold 
that word love in that verse is agape love. So it's speaking to Christians. It's not speaking to non-Christians because you can't grow cold in something you don't have. And I kind of read this verse a little bit differently. If perfect love casts out fear, then to have love means that we are fearless, that we have no fear. But folks that live in this camp where they're, they're petrified, where they're wringing their hands and their perspective of God is that he's anxious and that he's off the throne and he's wondering, my God, what are we going to do? And he's looking at Jesus and the Holy Spirit and he goes, you guys got any ideas? That is not where God is at. God is on his throne. He is in Psalm 2 where it says that he sits on his throne and he laughs. He's filled with joy. God's not pining. He's not anxious. He's not nervous. And in this camp, there's the circling of the wagons, you know, where uh, there's an us versus them mentality, where they're reactionary, where uh, they get easily offended. I mean, just track one of the threads on Facebook. It's amazing what people say to each other and how they attack each other and attack personally, attack spiritually in every way they attack. But then the other camp are those that are excited and they are anticipating what God is doing in the earth. They see nothing but opportunity. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is confidence of things hoped for. These folks are filled with confidence. They have no fear. It's like they, as things grow and increase and get more wicked and more evil and more chaotic, they become more and more confident and more on fire and more let's get it. In John 13, 35, it says, everybody is going to know that we are disciples of Jesus because of love. The way I read it is, everybody's going to know we are disciples of Jesus because we are fearless. If we just mirror what the culture is, is going on in the culture, in the world, we are not mirroring Christ. Christ is asking us to mirror him in the earth. Um... When I went to Columbia, it was in 2002. And I was going down there to a church conference. They were doing a small group conference on the G12 model, which is the model for revival. The pastor that pastors that church got a vision from the Lord. And he felt like uh, the only way we could sustain revival was through small groups. And I was big into small groups. I was working in the church at the time. And so I was traveling down there with three men. And it was post-2001, 9-11. And um, there was a, a lot of fear in the air. There was a lot of... Um, people weren't traveling, let's put it that way. And here I'm in the middle of planning a trip to go to Bogota, Colombia which at that time had the highest kidnapping rate in the world per capita because of the narco trafficking that was going on. And as the time was drawing closer for me to get ready to go, a movie came out by Arnold Schwarzenegger called Collateral Damage, which was all about the kidnapping issue in Colombia. I had people that were telling me, you're nuts for going down there. The State Department had issued a warning that Westerners should not come to Colombia because of the risk because of the violence and the kidnapping. And I tend to be an introverted person. I tend to, to battle fear. And for me to hear people say, even the wife of the pastor that was going with us, you're nuts for going. Her, her husband's going and she's telling me I'm nuts for going. I'm like, okay. Uh, and I had friends, I had family that were telling me not to go down there. And, uh, how many of you know it? Those times are when you need to hear from God. And you need a friend who's not going to tell you what they fear or they're not going to tell you what they see. They're going to tell you what they hear from God. And I might actually that friend is here today. He's a friend of Kirk's and mine, Paul Fernhaber. I called him on the phone and I, I kind of laid out the pros and cons of the trip. And I said, I'm scared to death, you know, to go down there. And I talked about everything going on. And the week before we were supposed to fly out, 
a pastor had been killed in one of the outlying villages. They had chopped his head off and played soccer with his head. I mean, these are the kind of stories that were coming out. Pastors and church leaders were getting slaughtered. And they were, it's like they were caught in the crosshairs between the drug traffickers, the paramilitia groups, and the, the government armies because they wouldn't, they, they were converting people by the millions in Colombia, converting people who were then leaving their drug addiction. And the paramilitary groups hated the Christians because they wouldn't line up with them, but some of the paramilitary tactics were vicious. They'd go into communities and slaughter people too. So this was kind of the climate leading up to my phone call to Paul. And I said, Paul, I just need to hear from God. And I'm not hearing. What I'm feeling are giants. And Paul said to me probably the most profound thing I've ever heard, and I want to say it to you because I believe this is a word from the Lord for all of us. If the decision you are making is based on fear, then you need to get on that plane and you need to go to Columbia. And I knew, you know how the word of the Lord has a ring of truth. The minute you hear it, you're like, that's him. All the other voices that were telling me I was crazy for going, there wasn't that ring of truth. But the minute he said, if it's fear that's keeping you from getting on that plane, you get on that plane. So I got on the plane. And the guy sitting across the aisle from me was headed to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, the war had already started. And he was a military contractor. And he asked me, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Bogota, Colombia. He said, I'd rather be going where I'm going than where you're going. And so, you know, immediately I was getting hit. It's not like the giant shut up. And uh, we landed in Miami. And in Miami, we were hauling five-foot-tall boxes of Beanie Babies to an orphanage down in Columbia. And each one of us had a five-foot-tall box. By the time we got to Miami, they were more of like a circle because they had been busted open so many times. And we stood in line with these boxes for five hours. And when we finally checked in at the desk, they said, oh, your plane is broke down, so you won't be flying out today. And they said, but what we can do is we could fly you into Medellin in the middle of the night, or we could fly you out tomorrow into Bogota. And I had had a dream prior to this. And in the dream, we were in an airport in the middle of the night, and a truckload of men with, with weapons we're coming to the airport, and we knew that it was dangerous in the dream. So immediately when they said, we'll fly you into Medellin in the middle of the night, I start to panic, like, I don't want to go into Medellin in the middle of the night. And a uh, Colombian pilot was standing behind us, and he said, would you like some advice? Don't fly into Medellin in the middle of the night, because you will never make it to Bogota. And the pastor that we were flying, that was going with us, he spoke Spanish and he said, I think we're going to spend the night and fly out tomorrow. So, so that's what we did. We spent the night, we flew out the next day, we got into Bogota and we got to the airport. And the first thing that happened was all, and you have to understand in Colombia, there's corruption everywhere. You're going to get sh shook down at the airport no matter what. If you are from the United States, Shakedown is kind of part, part and parcel. And the leader of the security got in my face and he screamed, you know, in Spanish. And I don't speak Spanish, <laughs> except a little bit. I, I knew enough to say, no hablo espanol. And, uh, and I pointed at Ken, who was the pastor who spoke Spanish. And, he, you know, all of this, though, for me is fear. It is this panicky feeling. So he walks over to Ken and Ken is the most fearless person I have ever known. He is an apostle in South America. And he just started cracking open our Beanie Babies because that was the whole issue. They wanted to know what's in the Beanie Babies. They thought we were trying to compete with their export business of drugs by importing drugs in Beanie Babies. So Ken just started grabbing Beanie Babies out and tossing them to everybody. And people came out of the woodwork, all these security people. They all wanted a Beanie Baby. It was the first time a beanie baby sufficed in a shakedown. Uh, it was nuts. Uh, but we left the airport and we got into traffic. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a country like Bogota or like Colombia, 
But they have traffic signals, but nobody looks at them. It's kind of like a suggestion. So you come to a, a red light, and the guy that's driving our car just speeds right through it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And they're like, yeah, these are just suggestions. We don't follow traffic lights. And I mean, the traffic would weave in and out and in and out and in and out of each other. And uh, we got to our host's home, and I had a couple who were hosting me. They put me in a secured apartment complex. They would never let me be alone. If we were in, in any kind of uh, crowd, they would have their arm linked around mine. And I finally asked Sophia, I said, Sophia, why are you doing that? And she said, because if somebody tries to take you, I will feel it. But if you're not attached to me somehow, they can take you and I'll never know it. You know, you're hearing this kind of stuff and you're thinking, dear God, what have I gotten myself into? And she was uh, the treasurer for their church. And so anytime she had to go to the bank, she had to have people escort her to the bank because it was so dangerous. Everywhere we went in Columbia, people were carrying AK-47s. They would, we ate in a coffee shop, but there were bullet holes that were riddled all over the coffee shop because there had been a shootout there the week before. Uh, you would walk down the street and you'd pass a guy carrying an automatic weapon. It was just commonplace to them. And I was watching the church people almost in awe because they just seemed to walk in so much peace. And I was walking in so much fear. And... Uh, we went to the conference, and the conference is about, uh, I can't even tell you how many thousands of people were there. They were from all over the world, and they packed into this arena. And uh, Benny Hinn came to speak at the conference. And I shared this in school, but my first thought was, I come all the way to South America to see Benny Hinn. I had seen Benny Hinn probably eight times in my life. And... Um, he got up on the stage, and that night, you know how Benny Hinn is. He's very flamboyant, very gregarious. He'll throw his coat at people, and they'll get healed, or he'll blow on the crowd, and the Holy Spirit will fall on people. That night, he comes on the stage, and there was none of that. He was very somber. He was very serious. And the pastors of this church, Cesar and Claudia Castellanos, their story is another story altogether. I'm going to digress here just a minute. In 1997, they were coming or leaving church and on their way home, they had their four daughters and their two nephews in the car, and they were ambushed by, they don't know whether it was paramilitary or if it was FARC, they don't know who it was. And uh, Cesar was shot four times in the chest, in the neck, in the arm, and his wife was shot three times in the arm and in the leg. And it took weeks for them to recover from that. Fortunately, the children weren't harmed. Uh, whoever did it, whoever ambushed them, they don't know because they got away. In 97, they were in the beginnings of revival. And when I went in 2002, they had over 30,000 small groups. And they had, uh, now, today, they have 150,000 people in their church. But they did not let that fear stopped them. Once they were recovered, the first thing they did was they got back into the pulpit and they preached. And so when I went to this conference, I knew that this was who was getting up in front of me. And their fearlessness convicted me to the core. Because I'm thinking, I'm coming from America. What do we got to fear? And these people are living in constant fear opportunity to give way to that and they don't they're fearless they're courageous they put themselves out there continually so that night that Benny Hinn comes to speak and he gets up on the stage Cesar and Claudia are up on the stage with him and several other leaders some from America some from Colombia and they get up to speak he gets up to speak and he talks about how what was coming on the earth and he said that there would be and remember this is post 9-11 January 2002 that there would be a rise of radical Islam and at that time I mean we knew that the terrorists had been Muslims but we weren't seeing near what we see today so he was in essence prophesying what we're living in today and he said of course that 
when the two great men of God passed, that it would usher in the last great outpouring. And when he finished, and I can't even tell you uh, how he ended. <laughs> I don't even know what happened to the man after that moment. Because what began to happen in that arena, you know, I always had this question in my mind, how do these people live the way they did, live so fearlessly? I'm telling you, this is how. The presence of God came on that arena. And you hear the, the expression in the Bible, Shekinah glory of God, that, that literally means kabod, the heaviness of God. I never knew what that meant until that night because when the presence of God came on that arena, people were literally crushed to the ground. And I'm not talking one falling here, one falling there. I'm talking collectively an arena of thousands upon thousands of people getting crushed to the floor. You could hear chairs flying all over the place. You could see bodies falling all over the place. Nobody was laughing. What you were hearing in that arena were people shrieking out in utter terror because the presence of God was coming on them. It reminded me of Ezekiel and Isaiah when they talked about their encounter with the presence of God, how they literally fell flat on their face because of the fear and the terror that came on them and the sense of their, their own dirtiness. And I'm telling you, when, the, when God started coming on me, uh, it was like I'd walked with him since I was 16 years old, but I felt so dirty. All I could feel was my sin. And I got smashed to the floor and I could hear people all over just shrieking and moaning and crying out to God. And I heard some woman screaming, have mercy on me, oh God, have mercy on me, oh God. And I realized it was me that was screaming it. And I saw a vision, and in my vision, I could see like a pool of the blood of Jesus. And I just kept cupping his blood and pouring it over my head and saying, Have mercy on me, oh God. Have mercy on me, oh God. And all of a sudden, you felt like this cool breeze just blow through the room. And I just felt this incredible sense, this awareness that Jesus saved me from that. That's what he saved us from. That he loved us that much to save us from that. And when I finally pulled myself up off the floor, it was like pickup sticks. There were people in chairs everywhere. And people were getting up and, and just had this deer in the headlights look of what on earth was that? They knew that it was God, but I, I don't think anyone in that room, in that arena could tell you that they had ever experienced anything like that. And I came away from that experience and I said, God, now I know why they walk fearlessly. Because I'm telling you, the fear I felt in that moment in the presence of the living God, so far eclipsed all the fears I felt leading up to that. Fear of, you know, terrorism, fear of crashing, fear of being kidnapped, fear of being murdered. It was totally and completely eclipsed in that moment. The scriptures teach, and I can't find the reference, um, do not fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who after the body dies can take the body and the soul and throw them both into hell. God... He set the example for us of what it looks like to live fearlessly in Jesus. When they arrested Jesus, Jesus was not running from the authorities. He was running to them. When they arrested him, he rode boldly into Jerusalem knowing what awaited him. He knew then that he was going to die on the cross. He was going to suffer. 
And he, then we don't even know fully what happened to him when he went into hell. But we know that at the resurrection that he had overcome. And in Hebrews 2 and 3, it says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He, he couldn't even see the cross because he was looking at the joy that was set before him. He was looking at us. And he wants us to live with that kind of fearlessness. On Friday, I was really wrestling with what I was supposed to talk about. And I was crying out to the Lord in all honesty. And I was so tired because, like I told Casey, I probably have a hundred sermons I've put together in a matter of a month. And I laid down to take a nap. And I just said, Father, you know, I know you're saying be still and know that you're a God. But right now, if you can't talk to me when I'm awake, talk to me when I go to sleep. And I fell asleep and I fell into a real deep, deep sleep. And I had a dream. And the only thing I heard in the dream was the Holy Spirit said to me, tell them about the Daniel 3 anointing. And I woke up and I thought, what's the Daniel 3 anointing? I don't even know what that is. I don't even think I know what's in Daniel 3. And uh, so first thing I did was I opened up my Bible. And Daniel 3, who knows what's in Daniel 3 without looking? Raise your hands. Claire does. I know Claire. Claire's an overachiever. (laughs) We love her. (laughs) Daniel 3 is the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I read that how Nebuchadnezzar built this huge idol of himself, solid gold, 90 feet high, and everybody in every nation was required to bow before the idol and worship it. And remember the story, uh, the three refused to do it. And so Nebuchadnezzar came to them and he was furious. He was angry. He had built this furnace that he was going to throw them into. And he asked them to recant and to worship him. And it says of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego how they answered the king. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to answer you on this point. We do not need to defend ourselves to you. If it be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to rescue us from the blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That is a Daniel 3 anointing. That kind of fearlessness can only come from the Holy Spirit. And I looked up the word anointing, and an anointing, it comes from back in the day when the shepherds would pretty much lube up the sheep with oil in order to keep the insects from burrowing into their ears and basically killing them. So they'd pour this oil over the head of the sheep, and the bugs and the insects and the lice would get all gummed up and couldn't kill them. And... Anointing, literally, the word kind of has morphed into meaning empowerment, protection. And God today, I believe, wants to put that anointing on his people. He wants to cover our head with the Holy Spirit, with his anointing oil, so that all the lies, all the fear... All the things that are coming against us can't burrow in, take root, and produce fruit in us. Because I seriously believe, and I'm not the only one, that the days ahead are going to be unprecedented in that we are going to go where angels fear to tread. That the fearlessness of the church is going to be a testament to the world, just like it was to Nebuchadnezzar, That God indeed lives. And that he's going to look out for us. And I believe part of that anointing is uh, 
the loss of the fear of death, you know, that loss of need to preserve ourselves, to protect ourselves, that we'll go into this saying, God, you know, wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I, I'll say it. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And Lord, I'll go, and if you protect me, that's awesome. But if I end up dying, I'm telling you, we are going to be part of a whole cloud of people that have paid that price before us. And this is how we're going to penetrate the darkness that is in our world today. I love, oh gosh, I heard Todd White. I think it was Deb Lanners who posted Todd White. And I finally watched it and he made this comment, if I can find it. He said, there are Christians, or we will be Christians, that will walk in so much confidence that it will terrify the people that are around us. It will literally terrify them because they're going to be walking in fear. And when we respond in just the opposite spirit, they're going to want that for themselves. He mentioned in, in hit that video clip, Deuteronomy 28.10, all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by my name, the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. So today we want to do an altar call for this Daniel 3 anointing of the putting on of the oil of the Holy Spirit over our minds and over our hearts that we will live fearlessly before him the rest of our days. I don't want to go out with a fizzle. I don't want future generations to write about us and say, man, they live safe. They live so cautious. I want them to say of us, God, they were giant killers. They lived full on, wholeheartedly. They gave it everything that they had. Nothing intimidated them. Nothing scared them. So I'm going to ask, if you're in this room today, and I want you to be honest with yourself before the Lord. If you're in this room today, and if you were to say of yourself, and others were to say of you, they have that anointing on their life. They live fearlessly, like my friend Ken Shook. They live fearlessly. They're intimidated by nothing. They'll go wherever the Lord tells them to go. If you're that person today, not by faith, not that you want to be, but you are that person. I want you to raise your hands if you're here and that's you. Deb Lanners, Anthony. <laughs> there are certain people I can see it on them. Melinda Moore. I saw you and your husband come in. These are two people that have had to slay a few giants in their life. And the fact that they're still standing here today is a testament to the power of God. So John and Melinda Moore, I want you to come forward too. And I want you to form a line here and face the congregation. Deb, Anthony, if you're that person that you can say, I live fearlessly, I don't struggle with fear. I feel like I'll go wherever the Lord says, I'll do whatever he tells me to do. If you feel like that is you, I want you to come forward and stand and face the congregation. These people have already been smeared. They've already been anointed. I see it in them. That's why I'm so drawn to them. If you're here today and you can honestly say, I need to be fearless. I need that anointing God because I walk around a lot in fear. I feel the darkness more than I feel the light. I want you to come up and let one of these people pray for you today. Don't leave before you do. And they're going to lay their hands on you and they're going to impart the anointing that God has already put on their life. And most of these people are evangelistic because they're not afraid to go wherever God tells them to go. So they're also going to be imparting an evangelistic anointing on us. Did you have some problem? Okay. So go ahead and everybody stand up. And come forward. 
Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name for the anointing that was on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come upon us, Lord. Come upon us. Lord, like them that we will say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to defend ourselves to you. Throw us in the fire if you want to because our God will save us. And even if he doesn't save our bodies, he will ultimately save us. And we're not bowing anyhow. In Jesus' name. Thank you.
Come on. I just feel like there's more right now. There is more available to you right now. As we were just in this moment right now, people getting prayed for, and Susan was speaking, I just felt like I kept on getting this constant phrase going through my head, and I'm just going to read it. And this is what I wrote. Just because I am believing in a city, regional, and world, and world transformation, it doesn't make me an apostle. Just because I speak life and encourage people doesn't make me the prophet. Just because my heart cries for lives to be saved doesn't make me the evangelist. Just because I teach people doesn't make me the teacher. Just because I love people well doesn't make me the pastor. I am a child of God and I have a mandate on my life to release heaven to earth, to be a part of this movement of heaven. And I just felt like some in here, there's so much more than what you have today. There's so much more that is available to you today. And I want to give you another opportunity to respond to the call. I want to give you another opportunity to take a step and say, I need to do something today. I need to do something that brings transformation to my workplace. See, this has to become a lifestyle. We can't get out of these walls and then go back in fear again. Perfect love casts out all fear. If we say we're going to be fearless, then we have to live the lifestyle. So you're in this place right now and you're saying, I need more, I need an upgrade. Maybe you're thinking, I don't, I don't know my purpose, but I want to let you know that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. And whether you like it or not, there is a mandate on your life to release love to the people around you, to speak fearlessly. So if you're up here right now and you're getting prayed for, or you're in the back and you're just kind of going through the emotions, I just invite you to come up again and say, Lord, I need more. I need more of you today. so beautiful what's going on up front right here and we don't want to mess with that at all and we're going to leave these altars open for the next few minutes and I would encourage you you know the call was for fear and a lot of you might have giants in your life even right now that you need to take care of come down here and do that this morning we have people up here willing to pray with you but we're going to open this up for for other things as well if you need if you need physical healing in your body um, if you just need a touch from God this morning, I encourage you, come on up front. We want to stand and believe with you that God is going to do something today. So if that's you, continue to just move. Um, otherwise, if you're saying, you know, I, I, I'm good, I've got, I've got what I need this morning. We want to bless you guys. Don't forget if you're a visitor, please visit with us back in the visitor booth. Um, but we're going to leave these altars open for a few minutes. And just let God and the Holy Spirit just do what they want to do. So if that's you, please move now. Otherwise, we love you guys. We bless you. Have a wonderful day. Open the floor.
Feel the winds of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear. Feel the rains of your love. Feel the winds of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven, let us
if you're still here with us, um, we just want to say thanks for sticking around. We're going to only tear down the side sections of chairs today. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but one of our family passed away, Dan Lacey. And uh, tomorrow the funeral is at 1030, I believe. And there will be lunch following. Um, and we're just going to bless bless that family tremendously. But if you are still here, we're going to tear down the, just the side section of chairs today. We're going to leave up the middle section. Thank you.